All right, everyone. Thanks for coming to this talk. Uh, this talk is titled Smashing the Stack with Hydra. Uh, we're from Columbia University's Intrusion Detection Systems Lab. Uh, my name is Yingbo Song. I'm the middle author. Uh, this is Pratap. And uh, our advisor, Sal Stolfo, is sitting down here in the middle row. Uh, so before I begin, uh, even though I'm giving this talk, Pratap here did a lot of the work for this. So uh, heap your scorn or praise upon him at the end. All right. So an overview of our project. So Hydra is a new polymorphic shellcode engine for x86 platforms. Um, we designed this to bypass signature, statistical, and emulator-based IDS systems, basically. Uh, it does this by integrating several obfuscation techniques into one engine, such as uh, self-ciphering, statistical memory, forking shellcode, and much more. And I'll talk about these uh, in today's talk. So basic uh, smashing the stack. This is from LF1's uh, seminal paper in FRAC. You have, this is the stack frame when you uh, create, a, when you call a function. Uh, you have the EIP, which is the address of the function that called, the, this function is what we return to. It sets up the local variables. If you don't uh, have uh, bound checking, you can send a simple exploit with the no ops led payload return zone. The res return zone overrides EIP, and when the function calls return, it jumps into a no ops led and passes into the payload and uh, you basically lose uh, the execution context of um, your program to whatever the attacker sent. So just keep in mind what the, the three default um, zones look like for a regular shellcode. No ops led, payload, return zone. And uh, Hydra basically obfuscates all of these sections and adds more. Okay, so polymorphic shellcode. Why do we need polymorphic shellcode? Well, it's because IDS signatures for uh, shellcode is easy to write. For example, you can detect a string of hex 90s and that's your basic no ops led. Uh, you can look for a bin SH, and that's an indication you're trying to open a shell. Uh, so many polymorphic engines use an encoder to cipher the payload with a random key, but that doesn't work if your uh, decoder is always the same. And IDS can just try and detect the decoder, so the decoder has to be polymorphic. It has to change every time. Uh, there's also statistical IDS systems out there that look at byte distributions, uh, multigram byte distributions. There are also new uh, IDS systems being introduced now based on emulation, dynamic emulation. There's an actual sensor on the network in line with your traffic trying to execute all the bytes that come across the network. And uh, people have actually gotten this to work on 100 megabit line rates, which is very impressive. There's also dynamic disassembly based IDS, which, uh, looks, which dynamically disassembles uh, all network traffic and tries to look for large basic blocks. So normal, normal code, uh, normal data should not have large basic blocks when you disassemble them. And if you find uh, large chunks of uh, executable code, large chunks of instructions, it, it could be an indication of an exploit coming through. So here's a, a listing of Hydra's features. Uh, we have a no-op instruction generator, recursive no-op sleds. Uh, everything is randomized, in including register selection and clearing, randomized multi-layer ciphering. Uh, we do uh, junk code data insertion, Multipartite decoders, I'll explain what that means. It's basically we take the decoder, uh, break it up into pieces, and insert it into the payload itself. Uh, Multigram statistical mimicry, this is machine learning techniques to make your shellcode look like normal traffic. Randomized return zones, um, I'll explain what that is. It's basically jumping into different parts of the no sled. Forking shellcode, so there's some recent work now on how do you safely execute an exploit. When you, when you exploit a process, that process typically hangs, it crashes. Your code may run, but it, it might also throw off, uh, throw off an IDS alert. So this is how to safely execute your shellcode and have the vulnerable process continue executing. Uh, we also do something called time lock ciphering for anti-emulator and anti-disassembly techniques. I'll talk about that. Often in American coding, um, the shellcode can be pushed down to uh, printable characters range. All right, so no ops led obfuscation. Uh, no ops don't have to be hex 90. Uh, if you look at the CLED engine, for example, they use uh, the char ASCII characters A to Z. Any of those characters uh, are actually valid no ops. Um, uh, they're not, you can't use them in line as no ops because they touch the stack and so on. But you can uh, create a group of these, put them in front of the payload, and execute that, and uh, your payload will, will still be fine. Hydro contains a no-op generator that basically goes out and builds a library of all possible no-op instructions of multiple, multiple byte sizes. And we do this by setting up code to test. Um, we, we write code to set up stack and register canary variables. Then we build a sled using a potential no-op instruction. Then we, we write a validation code at the end to check those canary variables. 
and then we execute that uh, that payload basically. And at the end, if that no op sled uh, worked and all the canary variables are are fine at the end, then that instruction can be used as a no op sled. And we use this to find approximately two million uh, no op instructions that we can be that can be used. So it's not just you're not limited to just hex ninety. Um, there's also multi character no ops. Uh, for example, if you read the original um, FRAC article by the CLET team, there's something called a recursive no op sled. So what you do is you find all one byte no op instructions by brute force. There's only 256 uh, possible choices. And then you find two byte no ops where the second byte is the first no op, right? So it doesn't matter if you jump into the, the first byte or the second byte, they're both no ops. And larger no ops instructions recursively contain smaller no ops. So this is why it's called a no op sled, a recursive no op sled. So Hydra distinguishes between two types of no op instructions. Basic no op equivalents, which is what you put in front of the payload, and it basically just catches the execution jump and delivers the execution into the payload safely. And then the second type of no ops are uh, what we call state safe no ops. State safe no ops can be inserted between instructions. These are the ops that do not uh, leave the stack in an uh, unsafe state. They don't re <coughs> randomly modify memory. Uh, special uh, special con conditions are, are put into to place when we search for those. So we found about two million total no op equivalent instructions, the ones you can use to build a traditional no op sled, and about 30,000 state safe no ops. So you can see the, the large amount of variation you can generate uh, in a polymorphic engine. You're not just limited to just hex 90. So register clearing operations, we have many different ways of selecting and clearing registers. Most of these methods involve uh, generating random keys, moving the keys around, and then um, you know, move registers, subtract register, and so on. As long as it clears the register at the end. Does a lot of very, uh, various things before that. Hydra provides a large library of such instructions and, uh, and a platform to easily add more. So. Uh, yeah, for some operations, uh, random keys generated to further obfuscate the payload. Uh, Multipartite decoding. Uh, Hydra generates non-contiguous decoders. So in a traditional polymorphic engine, you have your no-op sled, you have your decoder, your payload, and uh, no-op sled will catch the execution jump, pass that into the decoder. The decoder will dynamically reverse whatever encoding method you use to obfuscate the payload. And, but, but typically decoders are contigu contiguous, they're just one block of code. And those can be detected by idea sensors uh, if you try hard enough, um, signatures or statistical methods. So in Hydra, what we did was break up the decoder instructions and then scatter those into the payload itself. The, the instructions jump between each other while decoding the payload. So you cannot easily write a signature uh, for, such a <coughs> for such a decoder. Currently only bipart decoding is implemented uh, where we have uh, half of the decoder instructions up front and half in the back, and we have uh, the payload in between. And uh, these two decoder portions will just jump between each other. Um, but uh, we plan to add um, uh, more uh, true multipartite decoding in the future. So multilayer ciphering. Uh, multilayer, multilayer ciphering is pretty much standard these days for uh, shellcode obfuscation. Um, we use uh, CLET, uh, Metasploit, even back to uh, the ADM mutate days, uh, people will just XOR the payload with uh, randomly chosen keys. Uh, even back in the mid 90s, uh, people were using 32 bit keys uh, to do in uh, encryption on their, on their shellcode payloads. And uh, that works very well against uh, most AV IDS sensors. So multi layer ciphering is basically the newer way of doing it. It's, um, you don't just use XOR, there are a lot, you can use any type of instruction as long as they're reversible. For example, uh, rotate right, rotate left. Uh, you have XOR, add, subtract. There are many different types of instructions you can use as long as the payload is decrypted properly. If you, if you add a key to your payload, you have to subtract it at some point before uh, in the decoder. So if, you, if, you're in, <coughs> if your encoder uses an add, your decoder has to use a subtract. And uh, in Hydra, the cipher order is uh, dynamic every time. It's completely random. You don't get uh, the same cipher uh, operations in each, in each run, and you don't get the same keys in each run. And uh, we'll have demos of this at the end. Uh, we use 32 big keys, and it's in, uh, generated yeah, randomly per, per invocation. Hydra uses uh, six rounds of ciphering, ciphering by default. I just lost my screen, hold on a second. Okay, it's back. 
Six rounds of ciphering uh, is used by default, but the user can specify a number. Uh, inline junk code insertion. Uh, Hydra automatically uh, spaces out your shellcode payload, basically. So you give it your shellcode, it takes that and spreads the instructions apart. In between the instructions, they, uh, we can insert junk, we can insert arb arbitrary data, basically. And um, well, what we do is we typically insert no op instructions. You can also insert anti disassembly code, uh, random junk, or uh, you can use, uh, use this section for um, statistical memory creep attacks. Thank you. Statistical memory creep attacks, which we'll talk about uh, in a minute. So, statistical IDS sensors are the new, to, um, are the new way of detecting shell code. Basically, they uh, learn, normal, uh, learn statistical models for normal content and try to detect exploits. What happened there? I think I just lost my screen again. Oh. Okay. Statistical memory. So Hydra actually uses machine learning based techniques to make uh, shellcode look like normal traffic. Uh, Hydra, all you have to do is provide Hydra with uh, instances of normal traffic that you want to mimic and it will build statistical models uh, for multigram uh, distributions. So what is, the, what is the frequency of certain uh, character distributions, certain two, char two byte character distribution, three byte, up to five, seven, so on. And it will take your shellcode, build a model of it, take normal traffic, build a model of it, and it will tweak your shellcode until the two models look very similar. And it uses machine learning techniques to do that. Unfortunately, I don't have time to explain that, but if uh, you want to uh, know the details of that, just, just find me after, afterwards and I'll point you to some papers. Um, so we do this using Markov Chain Monte Carlo. It's basically a machine learning technique to sample, build a distribution, sample from that distribution, and uh, if you recall, we have uh, uh, the junk code insertion feature. When we space out the instructions, we take the statistical mimicry uh, bytes and put it in those spaced out sections. Uh, ret randomized return zones. Uh, so the randomized uh, return address zone is basically a sequence of repeated uh, target addresses. They point to the no-op sled. When you write a simple stack exploit, you're hoping that one of these addresses overrides the IP on the stack. When the function returns, it jumps into your no op sled. And uh, the basic way to, to randomize this zone is to just add random offsets to each of the individual address components. It breaks signatures by um, completely randomizing uh, each component of the address zone. So, emulator based IDS systems are the new, uh, are the very new, uh, newly introduced techniques. This is, uh, they, they exist mostly in the academic setting, uh, communities. Um, what, you do, what you do here is you basically build a stripped down x86 emulator and dynamically execute all, all tra network traffic and look for self decrypting behavior or large basic blocks. And to defeat this, we basically use uh, something called system, uh, syscall based ciphering where we uh, exploit some type of OS functionality to grab a key which is used to decode the main cipher operations. So Hydra uses the time syscall and uh, uh, our, our shellcode will actually call, make the time syscall, get the return uh, value back, and use the most significant bits of that result as the key to decode the main cipher operations. So if you recall, we have the main cipher operations like XOR. Uh, those instructions are ciphered based on a key we get from uh, syscall. If the syscall is not handled, as most emulators can't, then the shellcode cannot be decoded properly, and it will look like random, random traffic. Um, but when it gets to the actual host and the OS can handle the syscall, then uh, the proper shellcode is, is properly decoded and it will run. So this also introduces the concept of a shell life, uh, which is where a user can specify uh, how good, how long of a window this uh, shellcode can run for. Because we use the time uh, syscall, uh, we can specify, say, uh, you know, seven most significant bytes and that gives you five minutes for when this shellcode is good. After five minutes, the shellcode will not decrypt properly and uh, it, will, it can't be uh, disassembled. Well, it's, it's hard to disassemble it. So network IDS can emulate all possible syscalls. That's basically the main idea behind why we did this uh, time cipher uh, idea. It bypasses emulators and it bypasses uh, dynamic disassembly based methods and it slows down human reverse engineers because it's very hard to figure out exactly where 
um, these little tiny mechanisms are. These are very small uh, mechanisms that we put in a few a few bytes at most. So, uh, forking shell code. This is something that uh, just got recent attention at uh, CanSec West. Uh, some people from Immunity Inc. presented a talk on this. Uh, we we did this at the exact same time. Um, we didn't know that they were also working on it. So basically, you have an exploit. You have a target process. You exploit that target process via a stack exploit, or a stack overflow, or something. And what happens is that the target process will crash. Thanks. The target pro process will crash, and that's not a desirable result. What you want to do is uh, have that process keep going, uh, simultaneously have your sh have your uh, exploit execute. Because if the process crash, if it starts doing weird things, then that might alert a sysadmin or some sort of AD sensor. So the solution is that we have uh, mechanisms in Hydra that adds forking features to your shellcode, where uh, your once the once the shellcode executes, it f immediately forks. The child executes the payload, and the parent attempts to recover the exploited process. It tries to repair the stack. It tries to figure out the the, the right return address so that the parent can actually. Uh, go back to normal execution. And we'll demonstrate all of these at the end. So uh, this feature is kind of hard to, to get right. Recovery is very hard. Once you, exploit a, uh, once you exploit a process, you typically lose EIP. So you have to kind of do some disassembly on your target to figure out exactly where the offsets are, the proper offsets are. You have to understand the target address space. But once you, if you know how to do that, then Hydra adds all this forking feature in automatically. So, Alphanumeric encoding, uh, most polymorphic engines these days use alphanumeric encoding. It basically just uh, drops, drops all of your uh, shell code into printable, ca printable characters range. Uh, we used uh, the alpha2 encoder, those functionalities incorporated into Hydra. And uh, we, also ha we also have the uh, alphanumeric um, no-op generators. And the alphanumeric no-ops are incorporated into the uh, alpha2 encoder as well. So the main benefit of using Hydra is that it has all of these different features. They're all modular, and they all uh, work together. So this is, uh, if you see on top, that is the traditional shellcode, knob sled, payload, return zone. And then you have Hydra shellcode, which is you have this recursive sled, uh, alpha decoder, time lock cipher, fork, and you have the payloads and the decoders all scattered around. So the, the goal of this is basically make it impossible to recognize that what you're looking at is shell code. It's impossible to use the signatures for this. It's impossible to use statistical methods for this or emulator methods for this. Well, maybe not impossible, but very hard. That's the goal of uh, this, this work. Um, and I'll pass it off to Pratap, who will demo this. Right. Got four minutes. Uh, I'll be showing uh, three quick demos here. And, uh, First one, if you just run Hydra without any command line options, you get a decryption loop. That's the multi-level uh, cipher operations that will be used for encoding the shell code. And the second one would be, if I, this is a small shell script that uh, runs Hydra three times and shows us the alphanumeric encodings of the shell code, such so as uh, the invocations. Uh, we see that uh, this is one, uh, one payload. And this is the second payload, and this is the third payload. So we see that uh, the content and the length of uh, all the three strings are different. And this is because we're using two levels of uh, polymorphic encodings, first at the binary level and the second one at the alphanumeric level. And the third uh, demo would be a uh, multi-threading test. So we had three, this is a pro small program that we're going to exploit. We have three functions, main, A, and B. So main calls A, and A calls B, and B is a function that will be exploited. And the goal of uh, the multi-level, uh, um, I mean, multi-threaded uh, shell code is to uh, return back into main, skipping A from B. That is, from B, you return back into A, and we should be able to see the in main uh, string. And this is the uh, vulnerable, this is where we're exploiting the program. This is the shell code. So I just compiled it already. Uh, so we see a shell here, as well as we come into B, we skip A, and we come into main. The reason why we skip A is because the payload would actually overwrite the EIP of uh, A. So we just have to get the uh, second last EIP, and that's the reason we come into main. And the third uh, test would be the time lock uh, 
test. I just invoke Hydra minus seven. So minus t sh tells us, tells Hydra that we need a time uh, locked shell code, and seven is a precision, and uh, we get the shell code here. So we see that the current time is uh, this, and uh, depending on the precision, the time the shell code expires at this particular time. Uh, we would actually want a higher precision, I think. Let me just invoke it again. This is too small. I'll make it eight. Yeah. Uh, so the time uh, increases now. Okay. Out of. Okay. Yeah. So I just copy uh, this. Oh, sorry. I don't see the app. Okay. Just too long. So uh, apparently this last demo was a bit hard to pull off. Um, yeah, this, the, the, the resolution is kind of messing up with the... Do you, okay. do you have time? Time test, I see this one. Yeah. yeah, the screen just turned off. Yeah, basically, like uh, when you uh, put in an argument for the time lock shell code, uh, only within that time frame the shell code would be executable, and after that the decoder loop would uh, fail. And all right, all right. thanks. I, I think we're out of time. Yeah, we should get off before uh, they drag us off the <laughs> stage. All right, thanks. Uh, we'll we'll be around. Uh, if you want more, uh, if you have any questions or want to see a demo, just find us. We'll be we'll be walking around.